What's the word, y'all? Today, let's sit back and talk about some of the youngest teams in the league and try to decide which team we believe is going to take the next jump. Check it out. I started a new uh, podcast even though we're not really calling it that. And we are the number two sports podcast on Spotify right now, only behind Podcast P. And Paul George, if you're watching this, I'm going to catch you. <laughs> I'm going to catch you. But that's only if y'all watching this video goes here. This is basically an extended version of these type of videos. These videos are normally 10 to 15 minutes. This is like an hour of me talking about all things hoops. First episode, we talked about Damian Lillard. We talked about Summer League. We talked about randomness. Y'all know how I could get. In episode two, we talked about the teams and players that are under the most pressure. So if you want more hoops talk with Kenny Beecham, I'll try to put the link in the description or just go to Spotify and type in Not an NBA Podcast with Kenny Beecham or just Kenny Beecham. And for you Apple Podcast people, it will be there eventually. They just take longer. They take like five days to approve you. Be on the lookout. And I'll let you know once it's officially on Apple stuff. Go, go down low. Let me know what you think. All right, for the sake of today's video, I think it's important for us to decide what we consider a young team because there's a couple ways we can look at it. If you want to just look at the average age, you could do it that way. But there's also some other stipulations. Like the OKC Thunder is not going to get some love for me today as far as what team is going to take the next jump. Because when I think about young teams, I also think about them being young and development, young and culture, and, and young and how many wins they had last season. OKC okay, was a game away from being in the playoffs. And though there is another step for them to hit, and I think they will do that, we can talk OKC okay, another day. I was more thinking about those teams that were high in the lottery. The Pistons, the Magic, I guess the Trailblazers, even though Dame is kind of over the organization right now. The Hornets. The Rockets normally would, but we talked about them pretty decently last episode, so you can go check out that if you want to hear me talk about the Rockets, the Pacers, the Spurs. Those, those are the teams that we're trying to decide between today. And I do want to remind people that taking the next jump don't mean that you go from a 22-win team to a 50-win team and just... Just one off season, but it's like that gradual progression, like the Thunder just did, where they were one of the worst teams in ball, and then boom, they're in conversations. They're in the hunt for an actual playoff spot. Thunder went from 24 wins to, to 40 wins, which is like the type of thing we're trying to predict in today's video. I think the recipe for having a young team hit the next step. I mean, there's a lot of different factors. One, they have to build a culture, and that's one thing that we talked about. OKC feels like they have that. They have to be well coached, because when you have a roster or a locker room with, with basically kids when it comes to the NBA time, they need some type of mentorship and leadership, and a lot of the times that comes from the coaching staff. And let's be real, in most cases, you're gonna need a star player. You're gonna need a shape, which, I guess it's asking for a lot because Shea is one of them boys, but a guy that can take you to the next level, a guy that projects to be a star or is very close to doing that. So as I'm starting this video, I have no idea what decision I am going to make on the team that will make the next jump, but we're going to talk about a few different teams, give the pros, give the cons, and figure it out after that. I guess let's start from the actual youngest team in the league, the Detroit Pistons. As of right now, it's hard for me to gauge exactly what this season is going to be for the Pistons. They made some changes this offseason. They spent a hell of a lot of money to bring in Monty Williams, who is a guy that can help set the culture because he did it in this stop and that stop and that stop. So that's a plus for the Pistons. They're also getting Kay Cunningham back, and he has become one of the more polarizing young players in basketball. And I guess I kind of get it, but I am still a believer in Kay Cunningham's ability to hit stardom. First season, he had some injury stuff where he was good, but he was also a rookie point guard. Year number two, he only played a handful against, I think it was like 12 or 14 games. And in those games, I think a lot of people look at a rookie year of somebody being good and be like, sophomore year, is he going to hit that jump? And in sophomore year and the 12 to 14 games, he didn't hit a, he didn't hit a jump. And of course, the sample size is very, very small for me to make an overall declaration on the star power of Kay Cunningham. And that is why I'm still in the camp if one day he will be a stud because my sample size of him in the NBA is small. The thing that worries me a little bit with that is he just missed basically an entire season. So if he's going into this year number three and we're trying to predict what team is going to hit the next step, he might take some time to gel back into the flow of the NBA. And for some players, that doesn't exist, right? It's like, I come off an injury and I'm, I'm actually better after injury than before injury. Some players, it takes half of a season. Sometimes it takes an entire season. And I just don't know enough about Kay Cunningham, his work ethic, and how the, the chips are going to fall for me to say that, hey, Cade is going to come into your number three and he's about to surprise people because I don't really know. Would I be surprised if that was the case? Absolutely not because Cade is a stud. The one thing I don't like about their team is this log jam at the big position. They just paid Isaiah Stewart. Shout out to him, man. That, that's a, an amazing bag for him. They also have James Wiseman on the team. Jalen Duran. They paid Marvin Bagley last year. That is, that is four players. 
And I would say that most of them project to be more of a five in the current stage of the NBA rather than a four. And I know last year they ran a plethora of different lineups where two of the bigs were on the court together. I don't know about the future of that big four core of centers, especially when you compare it to their wing positions, which is kind of a bad position for them. Again, I'm automatically rooting for them because they have one of the Thompson Twins and there's no bigger fan than the Thompson Twins than me right now. And he showed a lot of good stuff in Summer League um, about his defensive versatility and his effort. And then the offense was coming around too. Like, we'll see how long that takes for it to translate to the NBA. They did trade for Joe, Joe Harris and Cade needed more spacing in the time that he played in the league and Joe Harris can provide that. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is not the team that I'm going to pick to hit the next step. They might still be a year away, and most of that is probably because Cade might take some time to get back into the swing of things. Ooh, the second youngest team is the Orlando Magic. They are one of the more intriguing young teams because undoubtedly they have an immense amount of talent. Paolo Bancaro was the best rookie last season. And then Franz Wagner, I just made a tweet about this a, a couple hours ago. Franz Wagner is still one of the most underrated young players in ball. Because when I watch Franz, and this is what I do in the offseason when I'm deprived of the NBA, and I know we got summer league, but I mean like the actual NBA, I go back and watch so many different clips and highlights and, and so many different moments of players that I might have for, forgotten or not been able to watch in the regular season because sometimes we got 10 games on at the same time and I might not be able to watch Franz Wagner as much as I want to. So I'm diving into the film of Franz. And, and he is extremely underrated. There's not a hole in his game. He is as well-rounded as can be. Now, I guess you can add that, like, part of that well-roundedness is he's not superior at a lot of things. But have you, have you seen him finish at the basket? Because <laughs> that would be, like, the one determining factor, the one standout ability of Franz Wagner's game. But everything else is there as well. He's a versatile defender. He's a good defender. He is a underrated playmaker in my eyes. I know if you look at the assist to turnover ratio, it's about 1.5, which is not incredible. But if you watch the film, the playmaking shops are there. The Orlando Mask got a lot of cool stuff. And I know some people are down in their draft. I don't watch enough of the game to say, oh, Jet Howard was the right pick over Grady Dick, who was just sitting there as well. Or uh, Anthony Black is redundant to some of the other players in the roster. That's not where I'm sitting because I don't know enough about that. I'm taking it at face value. And at face value, between just those two wings, I think that they have a chance to do this. If you take a look at last year's statistics, there are going to be some things that stand out if you weren't really in tune with the game of basketball. The first one is, hey, the Chicago Bulls were a top five defense last year. Top, top, top five. Isn't that crazy? Vucevic is our starting center. We ended up with a top five defense. Uh, th that is insane. But another thing you're going to notice is the Orlando Magic wasn't too far behind them. They have that part of the game figured out. It's about translating some offense into the game. And I think part of the reason they haven't been able to do that is because the spacing is awful. They don't have many plus three-point shooters. Franz is one of the few people on the roster that are giving you a good amount of attempts and also shooting 35 to 36%. Franz does that. But outside of Franz, it's like, we'll let him do that. Paolo missed like 103 pointers in a row at one point in his rookie career. We'll, we'll let him shoot that. I came into this offseason thinking, what are they going to do to address those issues? Where they, they drafted Jet Howard, who was uh, one of the best shooters in the entire draft. And they signed Joe Ingles. One of the more weird signings of the offseason. Not that it's a bad one. I don't know Joe Ingles coming off that injury. I didn't see a ton of what he was before injury, but maybe a year removed. But he also is like 35 years old. So we'll see. Those are really the only things they did to address the shooting issue. And I think that their mindset is that addressing the shooting is relying on guys like uh, Markel, Palo, um, even Wendell Cardo, who showed that he can hit it at a decent amount of clip, to just have another year under their belt and have another year of development and turn themselves into a respectable three-point shooter. Because I'm going to read this out. Palo is 20. Jalen Suggs is 21. Franz is 21. Cole Anthony's 22. Uh, Wendell Carter's 23, Markel is 24. Like this team, again, as we're talking about young teams, is extremely young. And sometimes just having more years under your belt, another offseason to work on your deficiencies can improve a ton. I saw that they were in the market for uh, like 
Siakam, which it feels weird to me because it feels like your four positions for the future are set and I just don't understand the mindset, but maybe they see something that we don't. I'm going to put a maybe on the magic right now. The Blazers, I can't talk about the Blazers until Damian Lillard is dealt. I've made that decision. I will not be talking about it again. The Charlotte Hornets had an interesting offseason. They extended uh, LaMelo Ball. And you know, as me as a podcaster, as a YouTuber and in love with this NBA stuff, I listen to a ton of other people's shows because I just enjoy it. When y'all and y'all kind of listen to the music, I'm usually listening to a podcast, right? And I remember right after after he got that extension, because it was uh, on the tales of like Tyrese Halliburton, Desmond Bain, all happened in like a 24 hour span. Nobody really questioned the Tyrese Halliburton one, which is understood because he's a stud. Um, you did see some people talk about Desmond Bain, I guess, but a lot of people focus on LaMelo Ball's extension to say, hey, can, can, can he win 40 games? Can he win 45 games before we give him $200 million? And that for me, when I, when I hear those type of things, are, it, it doesn't make sense to me because in my mind, I have no doubt about LaMelo Ball on the offensive side of the ball. There is a reason why they ended up with the number pick that they had to get LaMelo because the team is, has been and it's just been bad. And immediately he came in after his rookie season and made them better. And then year after that, they won 40 plus games before. And again, the roster is not good. But you know who is? LaMelo Ball. Now, part of that is the, the reason the roster's not good because y'all haven't drafted extremely well, whatever, whatever. But I have no doubt in my mind that LaMelo Ball on the offensive side of the ball is an engine and an engine enough for me to want to pay him that type of money because eventually the goal is to draft well, make the right decisions, where it's not just the LaMelo Ball show, which that's what it felt like last season. Yeah, he uh, maybe takes some ill-advised shots and doesn't give any effort defensively on most nights, but that's just... That's not, what it's a, that's not what it's about right now. You know what I'm saying? And when I look at their roster this year, I feel the same way. This roster, nothing jumps out at me other than having LaMelo Ball, who should be even better next year. Signing, so they're not even really in the conversation, even though they're super young. I'm excited to see how Brandon translates to the real NBA, but I, I ain't got a lot to say about the Hornets this year. Is it cheating to put the Pacers in this conversation? They're the 20th youngest team in the league, so they're in the bottom third. I, let's do it because they are probably would be most people's pick. So they, they extended Tyrese Halliburton. They brought in Bruce Brown on the contract. They traded for Obi Toppin and they uh, drafted Jairus Walker. Those were their major decisions this offseason. And this, if, if there's anything to be said about this roster, it is going to be one of the most fun rosters in basketball. A lot of people forget that before Reese went down his injury and everything, they were one of the more competitive teams in league. They in the league, they were actually a playoff team that he got injured and you realize, oh snap, he's actually that nice. <laughs> because as soon as he was out of the lineup, they couldn't win a, a game. And Benedict Mathurin started off his rookie season so very hot, of course, cooled down and everything. And I think a lot of people are expecting him to kind of find that balance somewhere in the middle between his super hot uh, first two months and his super bad last two months, trying to find that, that middle ground. And Bruce Brown just showed all of his value on. On full display during the NBA Finals. Just the highlight potential was there. With Reese as a playmaker, with Obi as a trail man, they have two of the better shooters of their positions and Buddy Heald and then Miles Turner had an amazing season last year. Maybe a little bit skeptical that he'll be able to replicate that for another year, but if he does, I mean, this team is going to be in real contention for a playoffs, but because they were almost there before, I, I struggle with even having them in this conversation. If I guess I'm picking, as of right now, the 14th of July, I might be I might be picking the Orlando Magic, even though, of course, they're deficient in some places. They just have so many intriguing pieces and so many talented pieces that I think that they can make the jump. Now, what does the jump look like for them? 34 games last season, they, they should be able to get to a 500 team. If they were a 500 team this year, I wouldn't be extremely surprised.